with Miguel. Okay, if everybody's ready, it's seven o'clock. I'm going to call the Town of Batavia Planning Board meeting to order for Tuesday, September 6th. First thing on our agenda is roll call, please. Paul Marchese. Here. Paul McCullough. Here. Don Partridge. Here. Jonathan Long. Here. Steve Tanner. Here. Brooks Hawley. Brittany Whitcup. Here. Jennifer Zimbito. Here. Kathy. Yes. Uh, we don't need to designate an alternate member today because we aren't going to be voting on anything. Did everyone look at the uh, minutes of the previous meeting, which was August 16th? Yeah. Is there any additions or corrections? I'd entertain a motion. I'll motion. Who is that? Jen. Jen motion to accept. Is there a second? Second. Second by Paul McCullough. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. And now we had a public hearing. So did you all have a chance to look that over also? Yes. Yeah. Is there a motion for that? So moved. Second. That was Steve Tanner? Second. Seconded by Jen. Jen. You got to see your name, Jen. I can't okay. see you over there. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. We have a public comment uh, time on our agenda. Anyone that would like to speak has three minutes. Uh, I'd like you to give your name, your address for the secretary, and uh, you go ahead, Mike, you're first. Okay. No uh, podium tonight, but I do have a Vanna White assistant here. Oh, we don't have a podium. It's probably covered up with something. So I'm here in opposition. My name is Mike Palenzi, 9197 Alexander Road. I'm here in opposition to the Pike Road proposed commercial solar project. This proposed project can best be uh, contrasted that one side is about the money and the other side is about protecting their homes. I'm not privy to exactly how much money the applicant stands to make putting a commercial project adjacent to our homes, but I'm told it's over 20000 a year. The solar side has paid reps, hired guns, that are here because they're paid to be here. And once the sale job is done, they'll be on to the next project. Last time, neighbor Stacy Mullen asked how many of the Solar reps live near a solar project, and it was only one, of course, because no one wants to live next to such a commercial project. Even that one did live, that lived near the project said it was a quarter mile away. This proposed project is proposed for 75 feet from our property lines. The neighbors against the project are here because this is our homes. We are here because our homes are important to us to maintain the values we have worked hard to build to maintain the character of our area, to not have a commercial project <coughs> operating next to us, and to maintain our homes for our families as a safe place we all call home. We are not here asking you for a special exception or a special use permit. The solar company and applicant are here, are the ones here asking for a special exception. We are asking to maintain the zoning restrictions that have always been in place, that maintain the character of our home area and protect us from commercial operations adjacent to us. The current zoning provides the applicant with many uses that one, no one opposes. What do we, uh, in the next, I'm sorry, the next, uh, yeah, no. okay. thank you. What do we know about this solar company? The more we know, the more there's not like to like and, be, and to be concerned about. We know it's been in business a very short time. It's based in San Francisco, California, about as far away as you can get from a table in New York. There's only two projects completed in New York State. It was sued by a town in Texas, Georgetown, to escape its contract. In 2019, it filed for bankruptcy. That was a result of a large fire that burned down the entire town of Paradise with 86 people dying, with billions in liability. It is operated under numerous LLC names, too many to count. LLCs, LLCs open and closing. When it changed its name to Clearway, the press release said it was rebranding itself. Something I guess you have to do after 86 people die. It's not accredited by the Better Business Bureau. Out of 105 Better Business Bureau reviews, there's 96 complaints with comments of fraud, ripoff, con artist, and a forged signature of a grandmother dated after she was deceased. 
2000, last year, Attorney General announced fraud settlement. Last year, the SEC warned the public to steer clear of Clearway. Uh, and Lincoln did to a Ponzi scheme. 50% of the company was sold this March to a French company. The bonding that was discussed as the fail safe to guarantee cleanup, but $200,000 is hardly enough to be used for a cleanup. It might cover dismantling, but if you notice, they kind of slid in that the panels could be repurposed. Well, that's not very likely. Uh, and they, they can't be disposed of easily in landfills. So the, the disposal costs are likely to be millions. The bonding concern is potentially in the millions and should <coughs> have to have an annualized uh, escalation for inflation. After the fact, it will be impossible to force a defunct company to pay for the actual cleanup cost, and the landowner will be left holding the bag. I have copies of all these things I mentioned in your packets. Uh, Chairwoman, you have a little bit larger package because the complaints were so numerous that I didn't, wasn't able to copy a hundred different pages for all of them. And then this is the last uh, display board, and most important, the proposed project parcel is in the FEMA flood zone, the Genesee County Strategic Farmland Protection Plan, and the Town of Batavia Comprehensive Plan Ad Protection Zone. It was reported by the solar reps that the site plan was completely avoiding the floodplain. That's good. But the plan they have submitted does, however, show a large portion of the proposed solar project being built in violation of solar, the town solar law on the protected farmland area. This entire green area is the protected area. And if you look at their site plan, they've got that thing 100% covered with solar panels. Under the town solar law, which you all have a copy of, uh, requires the parcels of land within the ad protection zone shall not exceed construct facilities on 50% of the area of prime farmlands on that parcel. So that would effectively remove 50% of this. The, the house, barns, and pool, and driveway, etc., are already on two acres. So that effectively leaves five acres of that protected zone that they would be able to put a solar uh, operation on. In addition to that, that same law uh, has numerous other requirements, <coughs> including uh, seeding of 20% of the total panel area. Um, I'll summarize quickly because I know my time is short. And from a good planning perspective, the proposed project is a seriously flawed project. One, the proposed site has all the wrong criteria. In the solar rep's own words, they seek flat land, not near sensitive ecosystems or wetlands. This land slope steadily is wet most times of the year, causing concern for emergency response. And the entire back portion borders a large wetland and a group of WRP projects that are among the few protected acres in the town of Tavia. The site plan as submitted violates the farmland protection plan, limits in the town solar law, and about one half of the remaining parcel is in the FEMA flood zone. Two, the company is very questionable. They are not accredited by the Better Business Bureau and have many serious complaints. The company has only been in operation since 2017, has filed for bankruptcy, bankruptcy operated under many LLC names, uh, and has also been sued by the town in Texas to rescind the contract and his other serious judgments against it by the governmental oversight bodies. The solar rep said, if this project is approved, it will take a $12 million upgrade to the grid for any future projects. I would think that alone is reason to wait for a better project that doesn't infringe on a residential area. There's nothing wrong with waiting for a better site for a credible solar project. I personally know there are others potentially interested that have ideal properties nearby that offer larger areas of land, no adjacent wetlands, and no residential infringement. We are not asking you to stop all solar projects. We are asking that you not approve a special use permit to allow a commercial soldier, soldier, solar project in our residential area. There are many other areas for solar operations that do not infringe upon neighbors, threaten our home property valuations, 
change the character of the area, and this applicant has many possible permitted uses under the current zoning that are not objectionable to the adjacent properties. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak tonight? Yes? Yes. We can't reach that far. You have to go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. My name is Carrie Helkema, and I live at 9183 Alexander Road, Batavia, New York, with my husband, with my husband John, and my son Josh. We are the landowners of the Pike Road Solar Project Number Six. It will be on our land where we live, in our backyard. We bought our home in March of 2004. We absolutely love our home and the neighbors we call friends. Shortly after moving in, on April 12, 2004, a month later, John and I were sent a letter from our neighbor to purchase acreage behind our house. Contrary to what has been said, we did not approach the neighbor to buy the land, and we never stated we wanted the land to build a horse farm. We purchased the land in 2004 with borrowed money from John's retirement fund. The newly purchased land added 27 acres to our existing three acres for a total of 30 acres. The letter from the neighbor also stated that he had approached all the neighbors whose property backed up to the land, giving them the same opportunity to buy the land to extend their existing lots. None of them had any interest in purchasing the land. I'd also like to make it very clear that we never kicked the existing farmer and his cows off of the land. As a matter of fact, the farmer has cut the grass for the last 18 years free of charge and uses it for his cows. Over the years, we have always looked at making a sustainable, viable income from our property. In 2016 was the first time of many that we were approached by a solar company. After years of doing our own solar research, and in speaking with a close family member who installed solar panels, this is what has started our, our solar farm journey. It is not a decision that we made lately and without thinking about the impact it would have not only on ourselves, but our neighbors as well. That is why last year we reached out to all the neighbors who, who we felt would be directly impacted by the solar farm and told them of our pending solar project. After the town of Batavia approved 11 solar projects, we honestly felt that our project would have no issues moving forward. Then the moratorium stalled the project for 18 months. The town of Batavia, keeping everyone's best interest in mind, saw the need to make changes in the solar law, specifically to protect neighbors having a solar farm eight feet from their property line. And to protect the rights of landowners to make a viable income with their land. In March of 2021, the town of Batavia created a solar committee and put it out to all the residents in the town of Batavia to be a part of the solar committee. And one person in the town of Batavia had interest outside of the board members. That speaks volumes of the level of concern anyone has for solar farms besides their own agendas. My husband, and along with the landowners of Project Number 7, Dan and Kathy Ruder, were the only other representatives that attended all the meetings with the Solar Committee. The main issue with the solar law was the setbacks. My husband and I listened to the Solar Committee chip away at the setbacks that directly took acreage from the, prop, from the project and money we could potentially earn leasing the land. Thanks to the solar project on Route 5, which was not done by renewable properties, <clears throat> was often referred to in reference to being highly visible. The old solar law had solar projects eight feet from property lines. So it went from eight feet to 50 feet to 100 feet and everyone on the board agreed to 75 feet. Landowners gained nothing from the solar law changes and only lost potential income and time, but supported the changes with the neighbor's best interest in mind and did not argue on any of the setbacks. 
These are the first two projects, Pike Road Project Number 6 and Alexander Road Project Number 7, that are on the table with the new solar laws in place. The town of Batavia has put in countless hours, hired consultants, and they are proud, and they should be proud, on successfully writing a solar law that I am sure other municipalities will use nationwide. They simply had everyone's best interest in mind and worked with the town of Batavia, residences, solar company, landowners, consultants, and welcomed any input from anybody. Solar project number six and number seven meet and exceed all the new solar law requirements. The solar farm provides renewable green energy for generations to come in the town of Batavia. The solar farm will maintain a purpose for the land that can be useful in the future and not be more land in the town of Batavia that is overgrown with scrub trees and brush. The current cost of clearing land today is between $7,000 and $10,000 an acre. So once it is overgrown, it's not going to be returned to viable land for farming or agricultural purposes. You will not see the deer and wildlife, wildlife that you presently enjoy from your backyard. It should also be noted that the contract for the solar farm is 20 years with three separate five-year extensions if warranted. And I have some solar facts. Niagara Falls only produces 25% of the electricity for New York State. There are over 260,000 homes in New York State alone that have solar panel systems mounted on the roofs of their home or in their yard. 7,332 K-12 schools in the United States are run by solar power, which means 5.3 million students attend a school that is powered by solar every day. These two projects will provide clean energy to 1,500 homes a year. In closing, I would like to ask that the public leave the health, safety, and environmental concerns to the qualified individuals in these areas. The Town of Batavia has already approved 11 projects in the Town of Batavia safely and successfully. And John and I welcome anyone to our house to take a look at the solar site. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to speak, but others to go first. You know, on both sides, whatever. You want to speak? Yeah. I saw yeah, well, I saw him. Okay. <coughs> Hi, my name is Dan Ruber. Um, as landowner uh, for the proposed solar project number seven, which is located at 9071 Alexander Road, I felt it was necessary to submit a letter due to negative information and recent lies being circulated by a few neighboring individuals. Following the public hearing that was held on August 16, 2022, there's been some pushback from several neighbors near prospective solar project number six and number seven. Some of these neighbors have gone to great lengths to spread false information and rumors surrounding these projects. Some of this false information includes adverse health effects, loud noise generated from solar projects, environmental pollution, etc. They've gone so far that it's stating that solar panels will actually leach toxic chemicals into the drinking water, becoming the next Camp Lejeune. Besides the fact that this claim is false, uh, I was of the understanding that that particular area has municipal water. These particular people are even claiming that the sound emitted from the solar projects will affect dogs' ears. Besides the false information, it seems that some of these neighbors and others believe that these lands may be better suited for farming and hay operations. A portion of my land is already used for hay production. However, I make no money from that hay. Also, I'm not a typical farmer, nor should I be forced to become a farmer. Instead, I chose to utilize my land to harvest the energy from the sun in the form of a solar farm. So I guess, in a sense, I am a farmer. As a landowner, I should be allowed the opportunity to make money from my land and do as I wish with my property, as long as it meets the necessary requirements of the town of Batavia and is not breaking any laws. It should be noted that a large majority of my land is considered wetland, as delineated by independent engineering companies and the New York State DEC. 
Numerous independent studies were conducted to define the floodplain and wetland boundaries for the solar company renewable properties. Bergman Associates, along with the New York State DEC, conducted studies to determine these boundaries. The boundaries outlined encroachment limits for the proposed solar project, thereby preserving these natural wetlands. This solar project complies with all requirements defined by the New York State DEC, along with the requirements of the new solar ordinance. During almost the almost two year long moratorium, the Town of Batavia Solar Committee, along with their independent consultant, spent countless hours developing a revised solar ordinance. This solar energy law was approved by both the Solar Committee and the County of Genesee. This ordinance was developed to help protect the health and safety of the residents in the town of Batavia while integrating clean and renewable energy systems into the local community. During the moratorium and the time that this solar energy law was being developed, the public was welcome to participate in the meetings. Why didn't any of these individuals participate in the meetings or express their opinions through letters or emails to the solar committee? These individuals all had the opportunity to contribute to the development of this ordinance as well as the future of their community, yet they chose <coughs> not to. We all know a new initiative is to provide safe, clean and healthy energy services through renewable resources. The town of Batavia has recognized this initiative through implementation of several solar energy projects as well as the newly revamped solar law. I trust that the representatives of the Batavia Town Planning Board are knowledgeable and biased enough in their opinions they will recognize the effort put into place by the Solar Committee and not be swayed by a few lies and misinformation being circulated by several individuals. And then in closing, I guess, you know, I'm not going to get into the health issues. That's not my, uh, not my thing, but, you know, I basically want to say that, you know, my wife and I, we purchased this land um, as, uh, for our retirement. Anybody had the option that could have come and purchased this land and, and done what we're we are planning to do, um, and uh, we feel that you know we're we're complying with all of the requirements of the new solar ordinance. Um, and honestly, you know I don't blame uh, community members and neighbors for being concerned. Um, and you know I think it's good that they come to these meetings. But you know I'm I'm not for you know spreading rumors and lies and. Uh, um, you know, misinformation, uh, but, you know, I wouldn't put anything on my land if I felt it was a health risk to either myself or any of my neighbors. Um, I wouldn't want that myself. I can't blame them for wanting to come and, and get more information. Uh, so, you know, again, we chose to put in, you know, a solar project, and you couldn't have a better you know, a better neighbor, really. Um, you know, would you like, uh, you know, that we put in a construction company or fracking or we could farm it and put in a manure pond? You know, who would want that, you know? I mean, this is gonna be quiet. This is uh, renewable resources, which are actually, um, you know, helping by reducing air pollution from, you know, being caused by other uh, energy producing sources. Um, Honestly, I, I don't, you know, I, I get the concern, but in the end, I think uh, this is really, you know, a, a good option for, for this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, you're next, sir. Me? Yeah. Okay. You hit your hand up, right? <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. Well, I got a lot of stuff here. Um, I wrote a letter last meeting a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was. Your name, please? Dave Huber. Neighbor. Oh, you, you wrote a lovely letter. <laughs> Very nice. Great. Um, right here. There's some pictures. I got two copies of pictures. I think I got three copies of pictures. All the same, you know, there's one somewhere out here. Um, anyway, my letter that I wrote, I 
emailed it to you, at yes. least. Did you email I, it to I everybody? I emailed it to everybody. everybody, everybody on the panel has plus, it. Plus, right. I read some of it at the meeting. Right, because I, I watched the meeting on the computer. Oh, okay. You know, day two later or whatever. In there, it references some information. I'm a farmer. I'm not a research guy on the computer, but I'm, I do enough to be dangerous. <laughs> here's my backup information. There's like five copies here, so you ought to just you know, share a little bit. But this doesn't really, um, this is a copy of my last uh, letter, that you already have that, but yeah, we already have it. there's another one there. This is just basic hydropower stuff, you know? It's been around forever, not a big shot. This part of the world, hey, what are these pictures of? I'll show you in a minute. Oh. Um, this part of the world, you're the solar people here, I'm guessing, right? And, and then the families are thinking about it. This part of the world doesn't need solar. You know, a lot of other places do. Go there, please. New York City needs it. I have backup here. Maybe you guys should have a copy of these papers, too. Um, maybe if they want to part with one, you guys could have one. Um, this is my new letter. I have a copy for everybody here at the board. Here, pat these out. I think there's enough. And then some people saw it out here. Because I know last time you read some excerpts of my letter, mm -hmm. you guys knew it, the general public didn't. You know, I gave it to the Hilkamas a week later. You know, I sat down for three and a half hours with them talking about, you know, what's going on, you know. And hopefully we could be count or continue to be neighbors. I think we will, no matter what happens. Um, okay, so I'm going to read through my new letter. If you guys have that, you're looking at it. Um, a lot of questions, you know. I'm, like I say, I'm not a writer, I'm a farmer guy, you know. This is out of my wheelhouse here. I'm here because I think I need to be. Um, and again, it's not against the people that want to do it. I'm dead set against you guys raping our tax money, you know. You shouldn't be here. Um, we'll get into that. Question one, when did it become acceptable, commonplace, to do away with battery storage power in solar? All right, that's a question. Don't have to answer now. Think about it. Talk amongst yourself here. Maybe because batteries are expensive, toxic, explosive, technology hasn't settled on a practical, profitable solution yet with batteries, because batteries are a real problem. You know that. It's too expensive. You've got, if you guys put batteries in your solar power, you wouldn't do it. Um, a solar farm is much different scale than a house. A home solar system is totally different. They have a few batteries, they charge them, everything is great. Question two, not having the reserve power of battery backup, per se, I think it would drastically slash the power output ability by like 75% or more. Because if you don't have a battery backup, you've got nothing. You know, use it or lose it. Um, what are the accurate numbers on this, in this application, a solar farm? You know. All right, moving on. Question three, can a solar farm of this size without battery backup even meet, much less exceed, um, requirements to join the already very potent power grid we have? At times when power consumption is great, breakfast, dinner time, solar power is lollygagging. You know, right now, people are home trying to cook supper, and the sun's going down. Solar's doing nothing because you don't have batteries backing it up. Um, question four. Will a solar company be paid for the electricity they potentially create, or the power that they have created and actually used? This question shouldn't have to be asked, but scams are so plentiful, you need to ask these kind of things. Um, and another thing, how could this possibly be measured without battery backup? Um, and battery backup, solar panels, easy to measure, how much power you got going in and out, meters, all that nonsense. You could do it. Without battery backup, use it or lose it. How do you measure that? You can't measure amperage and voltage 
until it goes to ground. And when you're making it, use it or lose it, it goes to ground and you can't measure it. It's done. Gone. You can't use it. Waste. Um, I gotta see where I was here. All right. Or with net metering, that's a thing. Like if you got a solar panel on the roof of your house and some batteries in your garage, they have a thing called net metering. You know, which the meteor will spin, go backwards, and do all this stuff. So if you don't use it, it goes back to the grid, and boy, you're getting rich. You know, that's great. Can't do that with these solar things because they don't have the battery backup. You know, there's nothing to really, you know, you can't quantify it because there's nothing really there to quantify it, I believe. You know, all right, moving on. What percent of the day and what time period will a solar farm actually produce? You know, question, I'm guessing between noon and five o'clock, you know, the sun goes down winter time, it's dark at five o'clock. So obviously, winter time less. Um, question six, what time of the day is electricity use at its peak? When solar power is peaking, people are not at home to use the electric. You know, most people work and household electric demands are minimal during the daylight hours on average because when the sun's out, you don't need your lights, you're not watching TV, you're at work, whatever, you know. While these solar powers are going nuts, making it, not storing it, use it or lose it. So four o'clock, they go to they go home too. Just like everybody else goes home. You know, cook supper. All right, red flag number one. Ten year, about ten years ago, power lines were upgraded from a few thousand volts two-phase, zigzagging across the fields in this guy's backyard. Um, he can't hear because he doesn't have his hearing aids. The do doctor has them. But uh, they were zigzagging behind his house, among others. Um, now, 10 years ago, they upgraded. Now the power lines are about 13,800 volts. I, uh, I haven't touched them, but 13,000 volts, and they're three-phase, and all the poles are right on Route 98's right away for the electric company, you know, ease of maintenance and so forth, you know. Um, when they bumped up the service, um, our current supply of electricity is probably 400% more than what we actually use. And another little sidebar here, when they put the power lines in, you know, below it, they put a, like a row of triplex wire everywhere, whether there's a house there or not. They're waiting for the, a house to be built in this field. The wire is there waiting from the power company, so all they gotta do is hook it to the house. Put, maybe put a transformer in, maybe not. It depends on where the other ones are. So they set up the grid 10 years ago. They have nonstop houses from Batavia to Alexander, and the power to back it up and support it very well. And uh, so anyway, that's just the upgrade. And can a rinky dink solar farm join this grid and provide power for more than 30 seconds to the grid of that caliber. Um, why are we entertaining such a nonsense offer? Um, observation number one. Our stretch of road, the TV and Attica, doesn't have many or any big draw customers that require solar power at that, or require power period at that peak time. We don't have welding shops, machine shops, factories. You don't have a whack bill, you know, with, 150 motors running, you know, pumping milk or whatever they do. Um, there is none of that between Batavia and Attica, and that's where our main stretch of the, this power grid that these solar panels are going to help with. Um, all right, here we go. Red flag two. It gets interesting here soon. New York State formed the New York Power Authority in 1931. New York State decided that state-run electricity is best um, since most of New York State power is hydroelectric electric, and the state has the power to control the flowing water. Individual private companies cannot control international waters, Niagara Falls, St. Lawrence River, like the state can. So the state decided we need to take care of the electric so scammy companies don't rape the, the homeowners, you know, and also you can't have some rinky dink company dictating what Niagara Falls is going to do or the St. Lawrence River outflow, you know, you hear all that flooding and nonsense the past few years. 
Um, well, anyway, the state needs to run the hydropower to keep it in check. Observation two. According to the list, um, New York Power Authority generating plants, now you guys have a list of all the generating plants in New York State. New York City is the only area that might, and I stress might, benefit if it had battery backup, solar backup, power. New York Power Authority must buy, well, this is interesting, I don't, I'm assuming it's still true, maybe some of you people that are legal eagle people could figure this out. It says, New York Power Authority must, by law, buy electric from private producers. If they, you know, they must buy from individual private producers if they can actually meet the demands to actually hook into the grid, which is a very tall order. You know, you, you guys near solar panels, you know, hook on in the big power lines, you know, you know, you gotta know what you're doing, and uh, especially to make it worthwhile. Um, this is why these wannabe solar companies are congregating here. Because we, New York, are a cash cow for these money-grubbing so-called companies um, due to this law. When this law was written, this solar fiasco was unfathomable. You know, who thought 1931 they'd be putting solar panels here by Niagara Falls? You know, it just didn't make sense because they had a little more logic back then, you know, politicians. Um, this law needs to be amended to hold the solar companies to be accountable and functional. Um, they would all flee New York State if this law was amended. All right, red flag three. At the last meeting, somebody made a mention of $250,000 bond to remediate this solar panel, solar farm that that flopped, which is great. In today's market, this amount seems quite low, cheap. How does this process work? And this goes back to you guys, the solar panel committee, whatever, that came up with the rules. Um, let's see. How does this process work? Does the county actually have this money? Some escrow account? Is it an interest bearing account? Who gets the interest? Does the, the county get the interest? Do these solar people get the interest on their money for the past 25 years? Um, uh, inflation rate, affiliated cost increases, you know, for 10, 20, 30 years. Do they have to pay a, do they per, pay a percentage of the bond? Do they pay the whole thing? There's just so many things that are beyond me that, um, you know, it would be nice to know. It should be a million dollar bond. The county will refund the difference to the solar company someday, you know, 30 years from now, because you say it's going to work for 30 years, so after 30 years, we'll rip it out, we're going to cut you a check us taxpayers for uh, $48,000. That'd be great, right? Um, otherwise, who's on the hook for the difference? The county, the town, the landowner? How much does the... And here's another question that might put this in perspective, and somebody up here might know. How much does it cost the county to tear down a house on a quarter acre lot? You know, sometimes they burn down, or you know, something happens. They don't pay taxes. It's you know condemned. Well, just think in your head, how much does it cost to tear down a house, county's expense, on a quarter acre lot? I'm thinking sometimes you hear thirty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars. You know, whatever. You know, you can do it for ten if you do it yourself. Um, if you're going to tear down a house on a quarter acre lot for thirty thousand dollars, what's it going to cost to clean up thirteen acres of land? That's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Ain't gonna go far, especially as time goes on, inflation, blah, blah, blah. Observation three. The State Street Solar Farm, just north of Scalia's lawn mowing business there, it's appalling. They're, that's where the pictures are. Drove by yesterday, I didn't even plan on it. I just drive it, or, you know, whatever. Yesterday, I think, drove by, saw it, like, holy, yeah, did a double take. Bushes and stuff on the solar panels. You know, these pictures don't do too much justice. There's bushes sprouting up between the solar panels. Like, you know, that is great for my case, but horrible for you guys. And there's pictures floating around showing it. Um, so anyway, State Street Solar Farm, that's a sure sign of what to expect from solar companies in the future is these bushes and stuff growing in the thing. All right, observation four. New York State Electricity 
is managed by the state. And this is interesting too, you guys will like this. You might want to run with it. New York State electricity is managed by the state. Um, and this flood of solar companies touting the great benefits of the community. That's why we're here, right? It's a no-brainer. Solar companies need to just take the land they want through eminent domain. Let's see how far you can get with that, you know? You, you think there's a crowd here? You try taking somebody's <coughs> land to put solar panels on, you're going to have a civil war out here. And uh, so it's eminent domain. If you can go through the process of eminent domain, um, you actually got a leg to stand on. You don't. You know it. That's why you're... We don't have the authority of eminent domain. Exactly. Because you don't have the product good enough for the community to do it. Hey, Dave, got to ask, yeah. you, ask you to conclude. Oh. Yes, I'm at the end here. Yeah, because like it's getting I'm not a speaker. Long. I'm a farmer by, you know, speaker by default. In conclusion, here we go. Okay. Um, in conclusion, it's a planning board responsibility as a volunteer liaisons between us and them. Um, as a planning board member, in this instance, because we're talking about solar, you need to become a, a novice electrical engineer with the council, a crash course from a real unbiased electrical engineer. Um, in these below, if these below terms and on the paper you have could be explained in layman's terms and understood, I believe a very quick decision would be made on this whole thing. Um, if the solar project is indeed good for the area and the community. And then this is to the board members here. Board members, please do your due diligence and understand these in other terms. Don't let the solar farm people confuse you or make you feel embarrassed because you don't know what the what a phase converter is you know a lot of people don't that's not their everyday wheelhouse terminology you know yes you know so anyway you need to understand this since you're on the board making a decision on this stuff it's important to um, know what these guys are talking about with their fancy jargon um, uh, with a full understanding of some of these terms um, the true efficiency or more likely lack of efficiency of this solar project will come to light and in a bunch of terms and then at the end here when it's time to vote on a project such as this um, it, uh, it shouldn't have to be said but if any board member has any business dealings with out-of-state solar companies um, I would assume it would be understood <coughs> this board member would unquestionably recuse himself from voting because you know there's conflict interest stuff going on all the time and we don't we got to take care of our taxpayers that's what it's all about like i got nothing against the, the families that want it it's the tax dollars are going to be cleaning this crap up we have niagara falls we don't need solar here take it to new york city take it to nebraska you know california in the news today blackout Go out there. Arizona's looking for more solar panels. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to say something? Oh, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> Is it something new? A little bit. Uh, it's short and sweet. Let's okay, short that. and sweet. Short and sweet, okay. Um, since the last time I was here, uh, I did a little bit more research on the internet. Oh, um, your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Shirley Kenzek. I'm at 9215 Alexander Road. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and I was just kind of alarmed the, the information that I discovered on the internet. Okay, I'm not that great on the internet. You know, I'm a little bit on the far side of middle age, so you know. Um, I don't. The last few years have been hard on everybody. Um, I'm kind of a new widow, and I'm forced to make some decisions um, that I haven't made before. Um, and I'm worried that if I have to sell my pod property. You know, how much is my property going to be devalued because of the solar project being so close to it? Um, it's not a good time to um, to lose value in a property. Not that it's any a good time, but my some of my concerns are that um, the electromagnetic electromagnetic waves from solar energy. Is it going to affect the, the, the animals around, the wildlife, the, the domestic animals? Is it going to affect me? 
um, the pollution um, and the environmental impact. Um, I don't want toxic materials leaching out um, near the land that's near me. Uh, a lot of us in the area, we still have well water. Not everybody switched over to city water, and, and that concerns me. Um, what's going to happen to the outdated solar panel when technology advances and those panels have to be replaced? Do, do the panels go into a landfill? How are they? Are they recycled? You know, what's what do you end up going? What's going to happen to them? <clears throat> Um, with building the, the, the solar farm, you're going to be changing the topography. You're going to be putting cement in the ground, so you're going to be changing the water flow. And to me, it sounds like that there's going to be some flooding that's going to be involved. Um, my other concern is like the, the geese that are around flying. Uh, you know, I've heard, well, on the internet, I saw that sometimes the birds confuse the solar panels with actual bodies of water and they just kind of like dive down at it. Is it going to change migration habits of, the, of them? Um, and lastly, for the sol solar panels, I, I ran across a couple articles saying that it actually increases the, the temperature in the area so that, you know, some of our summer days are hot and humid. I can't imagine getting any more steamy and hot. Um, it just, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of the project. Uh, I think there's more deterrence than there is positives. And that's all I kind of wanted to say. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, can I just have 12 or 15 seconds to respond to the one comment that was okay, made? Quick, because we, we, it, it's our turn it's to just, ask questions. Regarding, regarding the criticism, This isn't the public hearing. No, okay. Regarding the criticism of why some of these people, including myself, did not come to the planning meetings, no one knew about a plan. There might have been a few neighbors that they discussed it with, but all these people didn't know. I didn't know. And myself and another person who owned 85% of the land surrounding this project were never told about it. Now, Are yes, you talking about when the solar... Yes, yes, yes. So I'm just saying. It was in the paper. Yep, and, so, yep, yep. Let me respond to that. Yes, I read the paper. Okay. And if tomorrow there's an article in the paper, oh, we're going to review the strip club rules in the town of Batavia, I don't think anybody would show up to that meeting because you'd think, well, they're not going to put a strip club in my backyard. Of course they're not. The zoning wouldn't allow it. The zoning doesn't allow the solar project either without the special use permit. Yes, no yes, one had a does. famous yeah, idea. But, but it does. I think yeah, I mean, there's, there's a misconception. Wait a minute. Now we're, we're getting a little bit out of hand now. This is not a public now. hearing. I know, but I just think, I just want to make the point why. No one had the faintest idea that there would well, the be a potential be project. Everybody, everybody knew about it. It was, it was okay. put out there for Dan, Dan, could you explain? The, uh, the special use permit? Yes. Got, I, I don't think they understand that part. I've got that and a couple notes to go over. Um, well, let's, I, let's let you do that now. Sure. I was also at the last public hearing. Um, just going directly, and I'm going to follow verbatim exactly what is written in our code, and then I will give you an explanation on that. Agricultural residential districts. You have permitted uses, then you also have a section B which states the use is required in special use permit. The following uses are permitted in an agricultural residential district with the issuance of a special use permit. So it is an allowed use in the agres district. End of sentence. There is also more to it than just what is allowed above in permitted uses A. So a special use permit, and we did discuss this with attorneys, we have gone to Kevin, we have talked about this, it is an allowed use. There are more regulations for that allowed use than there are for others. Um, so it is an allowed use as per zoning. Um, ju they just they to fill in... Question? Yes. All of the other solar farms, they all have special use permits connected to them, correct? Correct. Yes. All right. So you can't have a solar farm without a special use permit. Correct. When we went through the 18-month update of everything, it, we did have a lot of input. We had a lot of input from community members. We had other input via email. We had input 
the, uh, the, the Solar 6, Solar 7 showed up to the meetings. We didn't agree on everything. I can tell you that right now. There was a lot of disagreements throughout that whole 18 months. Um, there were solar companies that were involved in trying to get other things included in that that we found would not benefit any resident or the community as a whole. Um, there were a lot of things that we took from that, and we took that very seriously. Uh, there was a town board member, there was one resident who was not on any board. There was two planning board members, and I believe a zoning board member at the time. Um, we all met, we, we beat it up. We also took NYSERDA guidelines. We hired a consultant to come in who doesn't have any teeth in the game whatsoever, but who has knowledge and background for 30 some years of dealing with NYSERDA and solar companies. Um, we put a lot of time into that. The planning board itself though, um, and I can tell you that there's, it's difficult sometimes to, to sit in here because we, we all do get passionate. Well, I, I understand all sides of this. This is, this is neighboring properties against neighboring properties, not the individuals against the individuals. But I have a hard time when, when I do hear that you, you don't need to be engineers, you don't need to be engineers to be on the planning board. The planning board has a strict guideline that they follow from the town of Batavia zoning code. And as long as everything is met applicably to the town of Batavia zoning code, that is the planning board's responsibility. There are engineers sitting up there right now on the planning board. I understand that. But you don't need to be an engineer to follow the guidelines that the town of Batavia, that New York State town law, and that everybody set forth, you have to just follow what is in front of you. You have to depend on the experienced engineers that are on staff, the engineers New York State DEC, um, New York State Ag and Markets. You are to depend on the facts that they provide you in regards to the projects. Once you receive all that, if you are satisfied with everything you receive, you then go through your, your checklist for what is required in a special use permit. If the planning board finds that everything is met and required in a special use permit, you are following exactly what your duty is for the town of Batavia. Um, this is not new. This is nothing that, that we haven't seen time and time again when there's resistance to projects. And I understand both sides. I understand highest and best land use value. We've, we've went into that. There are farms that are putting up solar because that's the highest and best land use value for the farm now. I understand the protection of, we have farm protection overlays, we have farm districts. We want to protect it. Ag and Markets has stated this is a protection. This keeps that land from having square foot concrete building pads on that land for 20 years. When I say that, it can go back to agricultural use. This also, and, and it's recognized not by myself. I don't have anything, I'm to follow the book, and that's exactly what I do all the way through, all the way out. But, but it has significant impacts, I think, on neighboring properties, and I don't like the tension that it creates, but at the same time, I understand both sides of this, but at the end of the day, as long as everything is being followed per our code, that we spent that long, had attorneys and everyone else involved, that's our primary job. That's our goal, not to pick and choose. This can be located here, this can't be located here because I don't like it. Feelings need to be removed, in other words. Unfortunately, they're always intertwined, but it needs to be cut and dry. It needs to go by the book, which is what we've always strived to do here in the town. The planning board has always done a great job at doing that and getting the information provided to us. I am not all knowledgeable of solar either. I will never state that I am. But what I know is what it says in the book, and we need to follow what the book says. Cut and dry, we spent a lot of time on it. It is a permitted use in that zoning district with a special use permit, and you have guidelines of what that requires in the code book. Thank you. Hopefully that summed up some of the, the topic of is it a required is it an allowed use is it not an allowed use yes it is an allowed use it states it in the code book so it makes it an allowed with use with a special use permit with a special use permit yes so we have I want to guess two, the two special use permit sets up some rules more and guidelines, guidelines. Yep. for it guidelines. I've been on the zoning board for 22 years <laughs> but the zoning board doesn't do a special use nope. permit nope. yes sir there, there was a big sir. 
Yeah. Yes, Charles Malcolm. I represent removal properties. There was a big debate and a lot of uh, litigation over the difference between a variance and a special use per permit under New York law. That issue went all the way to the state's highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals. It was a case called North Shore Steakhouse. And the debate was, you know, um, there was a restaurant that wanted to operate and a lot of neighbors opposed the restaurant and it was a specially permitted use in the zoning district. And everybody said, well, we don't want the loud noise, we don't want the late hours. They, in other words, they complained about the characteristic of the restaurant itself. And the court said, what you're complaining about is the use and the characteristics of the use. And this is a specially permitted use in that zoning district. And that represents a legislative determination by the town board that that use is appropriate in that zoning district. That's what a special use permit is. It's, you know, I know that there was like this question, well, we need a special exception. And it sounds like we're asking for something like that we're not entitled to in the ordinary course. But what a special use permit is, whether you call it a special use permit or a special exception, it's a legislative determination by the town board that it is a permitted use within that zoning district, as Dan said, subject to additional requirements and restrictions that the planning board would need to approve. Contrast that with a variance, specifically a use variance, where the use is not permitted, and you're asking for a deviation from what's allowed under the zoning law. So what essentially we're asking for is what's permitted under the zoning law with a permit, which is why we're in front of this board, um, and as long as we follow the requirements of the code, we should be entitled to that approval. And that's a difference between seeking a variance, which is something that's not allowed. Not, 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 I just like to, it's more of a question for our town engineers and, and our, our code enforcement staff, but one of the, one of the um, items that was brought up. We're going to get into that in a minute. Oh, are that's we going to? Well, that's what I want to talk we about. We haven't gotten to that part Let's yeah. start talking about that. Yeah, this is what I'd like to tell all of you. What we're here for tonight is for the planning board to ask questions, and you're here to listen, and I'm sure most of your questions will be answered because we have questions too. So this is a work session for us. We're talking to the developers, and we, um, it's the only, and our staff, and we're the only ones that will be talking tonight. You can listen, and I'm glad you're here, because it will help you le uh, learn more about it, and help us learn more about it too. So this is what it's all about. Oh, one more question. Okay. Yeah, I, please, just, just no. briefly. Make, make it really quick, because oh, this isn't a public There was a new person in the back there. Go, go ahead, Kim. Oh, okay. Oh, you or me? You're well, it doesn't matter. One of each okay. one of you. Speak for you. Okay. Yeah. I'm Kathy Roeder. We have the Alexander Road project, and uh, we have been at the meetings for the solar panel. And unfortunately, these people were not for whatever reason. But these guys worked hard and long to get the rules set. Renewable Properties has gone by everything. They've gotten all this stuff that they need to get. Um, they set a moratorium right after we, I believe we had our application in already, and we've been waiting a long time for a retirement age, this is our future, and I don't do good speaking, sorry. <laughs> but it's our future, and we need some, we want it to finalize. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's been too long, and these guys have been great. They've worked with us to keep things away from our neighbor's house. You probably won't even see our project from the road, very little, if any. I'm um, not sure about these guys, but, you know, but I just, I want you to know that we've been here through the whole thing, and we believe in it, we've been extra special, careful about where we put things with the neighbors, and we just, we'd like it to finalize. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Really Last quick. person. <laughs> really quick. I just want to clarify, because I think, uh, Van Lang? Yes. Yeah. I think you were directing some of your comments, just a minute ago, towards what I was saying about you guys need to be, uh, you know, and, uh, electrical engineers. No. We, we have engineers on staff. Exactly, right. But what I was getting at is, um, did anybody think it would, people be able to grow marijuana now? You know, they never thought the marijuana laws had changed and stuff, and now suddenly you can, you know? And the same with like the solar. Rules change, mm -hmm. yes. The, the town board, they had all these rules set up for solar. Things ebb and flow and change. That's why I'm asking you guys to not change the laws, but just look at them 
is still maybe kind of gray, and maybe you could refine them to make them better. I, the way I look at it, I look at these guys, it's like drug money. They don't deserve it, it's bad, it's wrong, they're going oh, through all the loopholes. Yeah. 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 But you don't, don't attack other people. Well, that's how it works. Okay, maybe I'm wrong, like I say, I'm not a speaker, I'm a farmer. It just seems like ill-gotten uh, money. We, we, we get your idea and we get your letter. We get input yeah. from all of you and okay. we really appreciate I just it. Didn't I, I thank you all for everything that you've done to, to get us more informed. And now this is the time for the planning board to talk to the developer and ask our questions. And I'm hopefully, uh, we have lots of questions, right? Oh. Okay. I, I'm gonna, who would, who would like to start? Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, one of the things that was brought to us tonight was regarding the primate egg land at the, at the number, I think, six location, I think it is. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have seen that. Does that match our mapping? And is, is the coverage more than the 50% that what our town code um, talks about? Not in an egg district. So, uh, so it's egg residential. It, it's well, no. You've got your egg district, egg protection zones, and everything else. Um, that's something that we are still working with through the applicant. Okay. So anything and everything. I, I don't want to. I don't want to answer what we don't know yet or what we haven't received yet right. because we're still working with. And we we just set up a meeting last week with uh, the attorney and them to go over some of the uh, economic and social impacts. Uh, host community agreement, decommissioning stuff. Right. Those things are all still being worked out back and forth through the attorneys in the meantime. Would you explain what a host committee agreement is? For Go for it, Steve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I could, but I'm going to just let Steve fly right with it. I mean, the host community agreement is, is we went through the solar um, law and changed it. The town of Batavia opted in. Uh, when the state uh, came out with the opportunity to either opt in or opt out. Most communities opted out, which meant they would receive whatever the assessed value times the tax rate um, in the town. So, you know, the $2.50 times the assessed value of that solar improvement is what the town would receive. Uh, we opted in, um, we've gone through the solar law, law, which allows us to enter into a host community agreement, um, kind of based on what the social and economical um, impact is uh, to the town. And by opting in, we're allowed to do that. So it's something that this would be the first one under the new solar law. So it allows us to enter into an agreement similar to a pilot um, a payment in lieu of taxes um, agreement. So it's kind of the same thing, but different. Um, and uh, you know, our attorney and uh, we'll be working with the developers and our consultants to uh, to figure that out. So tier three allows you to do it. Tier four is a that it's kind of a must. Those are the very large solar projects. Um, so again, it's it's similar to a payment in lieu of taxes. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that, that's. All, all I was getting at is like, you know, obviously if, if what Mr. Flinsey's indicating with regards to this was correct, that would then go take you to a variance, but you're, you're, you're still looking into that. No, it wouldn't need a use variance. This project would not need a use variance. Even though it, it could possibly, because what he was saying is that it's in a, and it's in a prime farmland, and right. what our code says that 50% no, of the property, yeah. correct me. Because I, I mean, everybody should hear this. I have it's to say, it's not for the outside protection yeah, zone. Correct. They're, they're not in an egg protection zone. They're not in a egg district. We have egg district one, egg district two, egg district three. Our agricultural protection zone was something that came out of the farmland protection plan. And um, I believe we didn't, it's, it's identified in our comprehensive plan. It's not a natural zone. So you have to refer to the comprehensive plan. Have you, have you seen Most, this? Mostly everything to the north of the throughway. You guys have seen this then? No. Well, no. you probably should look at it because I, I think there's just. Is it in our comprehensive plan? It's a definition, yes. it's a definition difference because what he's telling you is it's, it's the agricultural soil specification. I don't know if it's your zoning map. It's, it's not our zoning map if it's in the comprehensive plan. The, is it a future land use or is it just an egg? It's showing overlays in the comp plan itself. 
The, the comp plan is our goal of what we want to get to. It's just showing f prime farmland, prime farmland with drain and muck. It that's doesn't show districts. Map. That those are the separate that would, types, but that you also be have to be. I, I get that. I just want to hear. I want to. I yeah. want to know that they know this, right? Yeah. And that we're that we're looking into that. And per the code, we had to submit an agricultural plan, and that has been submitted. Yeah. There, there were a few questions that I had noted. I just don't want to forget um, to bring it up and maybe answer prior to that we're at the last meeting about uh, decibel requirements. And I just, I looked it up a little bit on the decibel requirements itself. Um, and we use the New York State Code for what we look into and what we look at. Um, decibels of a dishwasher are at 46 to 60 decibels for a dishwasher. A standard household dishwasher is at 46 to 60. At 30 feet away, according to what we received for the solar farms, it is at 65 decibels. So I do want to clear that up as to where decibels are at for a solar farm as far as the volume of hearing the solar farms. Um, we have solar farms right now that are in our operation in the town of Batavia. The biggest issue that we've always had with those solar farms were all to do with the buffering, the trees, the plantings, the uh, the buffer zones, the hills, the everything. We have a massive issue with landscaping on our current solar farms. Right, and that's kind of so, what we so cleared we cleared up in our solar review. We did. We addressed that in the solar review with another, you know, whether it be you know a bond or whatever it may be. So we don't have those issues moving forward. The bond itself, and some of the comments that I heard, and I hope I can address, it is an increasing bond. It does require inflation. I believe it's every yeah, year. Right here, so it's, it is written years. right in there. Yes. So the decommissioning bond itself value does increase. It does go throughout. Um, and, and those are things that we we still have yet to follow through and complete. With, um, with this application? With this application, yes. With others, we have decommissioning bonds. We do hold the funding. So it is the town of Batavia. It doesn't go to any other entity. It's held within the town of Batavia. So if we had to but go ahead... provided by the developer. Correct, provided so by the developer. Taxpayers. Right, 100% correct. I just wanted to clear those up before I forgot. They were kind of fresh on my mind. I know I jotted a few down and if I get on another topic, I won't speak to them. Those myself. were good. Those are things I jotted down too. I have one other thing down here, the flood zone. I've heard people talk about the water, uh, the flood area. Can, can someone address that? Yeah, so um, Kristen Jacobs with Bergman Engineering Consultant. Um, yes, there is a FEMA designated flood zone um, along both sites uh, and the projects are designed to stay outside of the flood zone. We aren't allowed, I believe, by your code, if not by the state, to be in the flood zone itself. Um, so you'll see a lot of the borders of the projects are kind of not square, angular, and that's because they are Away out of the flood zone. Well, what if it does flood? Uh, I've heard uh, people say there can be two to three feet of water in that area. Yeah, there's no concern with the water. These panels are constructed to withstand all sorts of elements. They're raised above at minimum. The panels would probably be three feet to the ground. Um, and these are trackers, correct? Yeah. So they're tracking panels too. So they are tilting as they go. So they're not even stagnant, staying in one point. They will be tracking the sun as it goes from east to west throughout the day. Um, but there really is no concern. I know the comment was made electricity and water don't mix. All electricity will be already underground um, through wires. It'd be no different than having electrical wires outside your home. I know that they're not that low. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's no concern with these with flooding. Uh, I also want to point out that the topography change has been brought up a few times. Um, there is minimal topography changing. Um, there's no actual change to the um, topography of the land where the solar panels are sitting. These are pile driven um, posts. So they go in, they come out. There's no concrete other than where the inverter pad or the uh, equipment pad, sorry, that's a better word for it, the equipment pad will sit, and that is less than a tenth of an acre um, on both sites. There is one site with some tree clearing, so that does slightly change the 
water runoff of the sites that these have both been accounted for um, in the stormwater protection plans and we have stormwater mitigation in the form of grass filter strips on the sites to help with the flow of any excess stormwater but I uh, believe that the I would have to look into the SWIFT but it has been provided for the, to the town engineer for extra review um, they do not significantly increase runoff from uh, current existing conditions, uh, I believe we are less than 5%, which means there's very little mitigation needed. Um, the road itself is a pervious, er, yes, pervious, not impervious, <laughs> making sure I'm saying the right words, a uh, pervious gravel driveway that is designed by the New York DEC specifically for solar projects. It's a limited use gravel that is meant to act as if it was still the ground itself. So there, these are very, very low impact to the existing land, um, as it was pointed out. The New York State Department of Ag and Markets does consider this in a protection of ag lands because it, it's probably the only thing right now that you can put in and take out and return the earth to existing, if not better, conditions after it's allowed to fallow over the lifespan of the project and let the soils re-up the nutrients in there that would be stripped from excessive farming. Thank you. We also have a uh, state uh, shippo State Historic Preservation and also has no issue with either site, just so you guys are aware of that as well. Um, yeah, have you provided the applicant with any of our previous special use permits so that they know kind of what the requirements I, of that might be? I have not. They would be foilable if they're upon request, yeah. but we don't just, I mean, we don't submit them. As far as the pollinator mix, yes, we will be yeah. working with pollinator mixes, working with what has worked and what has not worked. I have discussed what has worked and what we have seen not work in accordance with what our code says. What um, he's talking about is that we've asked uh, the developer to plant um, plantings that attract bees and other uh, pollinating insects to, uh, in order to keep an agricultural use for that land. We require yes, and the developer to do It's that. required at a minimum of 20% and we are proposing it on 100% of the land. Um, and it's proposed in the site plan at the, uh, on the end pages, but we are open to knowing exactly what will work for you guys. So that's every, every solar we've had so far has done to the max yeah. for under plantings. Um, if they do not take, we do go out there. Soil and conservation also goes. Um, they they check everything. They do a sign off to make sure that they're well above what that needs for percentage, and then they sign off and get that to us as well. We go out there every year on a special use permit. We do a full walkthrough of all sites. Like I said, the biggest take and the biggest plus that we have in the new solar code is obviously for all of the tree plantings and everything else that are on site. Yeah, we took a long time developing that pollinated thing with Cornell proper extension and uh, the soil and water districts. And uh, it's designed to not just be a one season pollinator, it's designed to have multiple different bloomings of, of uh, the plant life so that the, you can have lots of different bees and uh, you know, pollinating kind of thing. And, and uh, that the goal was to, to help the beehive people. Um, and, Know, get bees because bees are good for you know uh, farms. Okay, how about you, Paul? No, I actually, quite, Dan's been answering my question right quite a long Yeah, he's been answering my question. Almost oh. everything that I wrote down is like a. No. Okay, John? Um, I don't have anything additional. We still do have to go through the site plan review um, you know, to address some of the landscaping and we can make modifications based on that. And also the uh, seeker, the quality review. Um, those two things have to be done so we can make make minor changes to the project that we see be necessary. And we have submitted a revised site plan that indicates the new. We have sorry, Anthony Bell with renewable property. Um, we submitted uh, a revised site plan that included proposed plantings for both projects, um, both the locations and the proposed uh, species to be used for your review. So um, we look forward to getting. I sent it to you. 
Yeah. And I scanned it. Because I didn't see it. I sent it today. Oh, it was today? I didn't look today. Yeah, I so so I brought hard copies. It's just the landscape plan is different. Yeah, if you don't mind giving oh, me it, a copy. Oh, I passed it on already. Unfortunately, you had my work they email, might be. and I didn't work until today. <laughs> that's, that's And so I passed it on to everyone today. Yeah, that is a landscape plan. Okay, so this right here. Yeah. This yeah. is the given the holiday. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so those are there for your review, and you know, based on, because um, in um, Mr. Mountain's uh, comment letter also mentioned proposed planting so that's what we're proposing and um, pending your review and comment we can then use those to turn into visual simulations which we'll present um, as visual aids for what they will look like renderings for what that will look like in the future with those specific planting proposals and one other thing we, we kind of um, the recent projects that have been passed uh, the number of tie-in connection poles mm -hmm. for the equipment. We, we stress to go to ground mounted as much as possible. I think the last one was... They've all been three, three since we've yeah, gotten to that point. Yeah. So yeah. right here on this site plan, you know, in, on some of the renderings we saw, there were like five or six. Right. We're going to request that that gets modified to three. We can, uh, so again, that's something that's sort of stipulated by the utility. Yep, and, that's and we work with the utility. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the utility has gotten us to three every time. All right, well, we'll follow up with them. And um, if for some reason, in our case, they're insisting it, we can provide that to you so you know that it is not us, it's them. Okay, hey, hello down here. No, I have all my questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like specifically sent to me the exact special use for the guidelines that you're talking about for each of these projects so I can check them off. I will send that to the whole board. It's, re it's available via e codes, though, right, Dan? Yeah, it is. Yeah. But I, I'll still have the, the teacher to. Is that e It is on e codes. I will send that right over. That was a loaded question. I need the answer. It is on e codes. It was not last week. Steve, if you get something to add that will help us, we're getting ready to do the sticker review, which is environmental. And uh, that will be done at our next meeting, hopefully. If, if uh, the engineers have all the information that they need, we will, we will do that. And you're welcome to come and listen to it. So you received our request for extension, yes. For oh, that's for right. Speaker. I forgot to tell you yeah, that. Yeah, you did receive it because I saw that in the email. I wrote that, I wrote that, 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 yeah, I wrote that on my agenda here so I wouldn't forget. Uh, we did make a mutual agreement to extend the seeker. Once the, see the seeker is given to us and uh, we seek lead agency, we have a time period that we have to meet. But with mutual agreement, we can extend it. And we have extended it so that we can gather more information. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I meant to, it'll go in the minutes, right, Kim? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because as we do the site plan review, then that might change what answers the seeker are, too. Right. Yeah, the only thing that we've done is just declare a lead agency. There was nothing for Bergman for extending their. No, that, that's seeker. what we want to do. That's, that, what, right? that's what, yeah, but uh, I would just like that in the minutes that we've mutually agreed mutually to extend the seeker period. Thank you. Okay. I have a question for you. Yes. So, so how uh, deep do you put your conduit? Yeah. Conduits usually between three to four feet. If, uh, we're, if uh, we're following the if we're following the nice dam guidelines, yeah, we don't make you because that's not as good as what we what we've done in the past was eighteen inches we because there's less disturbance of soils. Minimum NEC requirements for it, just so you're aware. Well, shower would be better for us. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so the minimum <laughs> NEC requirements are for the soil too. You're yeah. not mixing the subsoil with the drop soil, so that's one thing that this town. Is required is to keep it in, in the top soil. So when it's taken out, it's taken out. Right. Because I think the state says you can leave it in for depth. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Don't want it, don't we don't want it mixed. Want it and, don't want yeah. and they're also, but they're also more particular about segregating the topsoil, having it sit somewhere on site usually until the restoration, and then you got to go through and backfill it, regrade, and all that stuff. And I agree, this is easier. No, it's it's better for the environment too, okay. in our opinion. I mean, disturbing less soil. Can you tell us some of your experience with um, the wildlife, animals, birds, it, it, uh, in other in other installations that you put in? Have it has it affected any of the wildlife? 
Um, so me personally, anecdotally, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, a growing, a growing trend and feature of these sites is um, grazing them with agri. You, actually, 100% of the time, it's sheep. They found out goats don't work. But they will graze livestock, namely sheep, on these projects for uh, vegetation control, as opposed to no, as opposed to mowing. Um, those sheep have not had any sort of adverse side effects or anything like that. Anecdotally, from other projects I've worked on, um, you know, these these projects are you, seeded with pollinator mixes, and they become much more akin to like a native grassland prairie as opposed to whatever monocrop agricultural venture was there before. So you see a lot, you see an increase in biodiversity but through from the soil up. So just the soil biome, the insects, but you really then see an increase in the bird diversity, that kind of stuff. Um, I've had projects in uh, other states where we've had like families of foxes denning within the site, the, you know, they use the panels for shelter, that kind of extra shelter from aerial predators that kind of stuff and we've had repeated dennings of foxes and badgers and other kinds of things so um no no sort of adverse effects to wildlife uh actually see benefits and increases the other thing that was mentioned about the birds landing that's referred to as um, a lake effect where they mistake in the large dark areas on the landscape as bodies of water that um was something that came out several years ago and has more or less just been disproven because most projects let, let's see I've, I've done almost two gigawatts in projects in my career and and none of them with several companies and in, across most states and in none of them have we ever recorded a bird strike on under any of our operating facilities so that's been more or less debunked um, I have a question for you since you're in the business. Sure. In Europe, they put them way up so you can have small tractors and Yeah, that's them. that's that's a new that's a new um, enterprise that you know leave it to the I European. assume that's pretty pretty cost. That's something that people are playing with. Ineffective. <laughs> well, so that's something that people are playing with and toying with over here already. Is that you know yeah? There's obviously a some increase there's obviously an increase in the required amount of steel because obviously you've got more beams they're taller right so you have to take more of a foundation you so you still yeah you also need to drive them deeper because of obviously the wind, sharing, deeper in that the wind shear the wind effects yeah so you got to drive them deeper but then you also got to have them taller so that you can get your harvesters or whatever underneath them the this something that is being played with um, a lot right now and seeing if it is economical in terms of both having a, <coughs> as a working solar farm and also as a working crop, um, you know, venture, there's a lot of work out of the university, or sorry, Arizona State University, Dr. Baron Gafford, Greg Baron Gafford, he's like the, one of the leading researchers on this and is doing all kinds of experiments with that and um, companies are starting to toy with it too just because it, it, it but it is an emerging thing. In, in respect to Mr. Huber's comments of asking how, how they're tracked and myself wanting to know with the battery, the battery backup, the battery storage and what he stated, can you just explain to all of us in here how, how do you track, how is the tracking process, how does the whole process work with going back to the lines to the grid? Sure. So the, the trackers, the rows are oriented north-south so that the panels will pivot east-west and track the sun as it rises in the east and sets in the west for maximum exposure over the length of the day. Obviously, um, depending on your latitude up here in New York versus projects down south, your amount of solar uh, exposure during the day is going to vary. But this is all stuff that you know, the industry has been around for several decades now that um, we're able to model and take into account the fluctuation in solar uh, radiance given the latitude, build that into the models and, you know, which ultimately tie into the viability, the economic viability of a project. So obviously a project like a one acre megawatt, pro or sorry, a one acre project in 
Um, the south is obviously going to generate more uh, electricity than a one acre project in the north, and so you model your economics around that accordingly. Um, it's actually a real testament to the fact that projects are being built this far north and in places even as Maine is a testament to how far the technology has come and the efficiency to which these panels can harvest solar energy now because you know 15 20 25 years ago you would have never thought of building projects you know n anywhere north of like Oklahoma you know and now they're as far north as Maine and in some boulder companies are starting to venture into like the more rainy states like Washington and Oregon. So the technology has come a long way. So the I think some of the question is right. the parts and the pieces and um, there's motor obviously involved or there oils or anything that's detrimental. Not to mention the product itself going back. Where does the product that's created, how is that going back into supply for system? So into the grid? In, into the grid oh, itself. Yes. Right, so we have, um, we monitor production uh, remotely. We have a SCADA, it's an acronym SCADA that it always... Uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Thank you, yes. So that, I'm that, one of the engineers on the board. Oh, okay. So that, <laughs> that allows us to monitor the production of the facility remotely, which is uh, beneficial in a lot of ways. It allows us to see if for some reason we may not be generating what was expected and it can allow our field crews to go out and investigate. It also allows us to detect malfunctions down to a panel level. So if a panel gets broken or something like that, we're able to go out and, re and repair it. Um, but it also allows us to uh, monitor our generation and make sure that it's where we need it to be. And again, uh, when I say where we need it to be, that's based on our models, which again account for obviously fluctuations in daylight both in the time of the year but also obviously time of day and um, that all gets flattened out over the life of the project into what the, the facility as a whole is expected to produce and that works its way, that expectation works its way into our agreements with our off takers and the utilities and so there's that expectation that you know if we're you know, not generating enough or if we're generating too much, that all runs through the utility and we have to answer to that, usually financially, if we're not meeting our generation targets, but. Um, so essentially, these projects, or, I don't know, this project, these projects, mm -hmm. are gonna benefit the homeowner and you. Are you gonna benefit anybody else? Uh, besides us and the homeowners, you mean? Yes. Oh, you mean the landowners? Exactly. Like, for example, are you going to benefit the other taxpayers in the area by reducing mm -hmm. their electric costs? I mean, are you, is there a benefit to somebody else? Yes, yeah, so that's what the host community agreement that's, is for. That's the town. That's not the rest of so, the community who's paying for the electric. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah. so the, the, the rest of the town will benefit through the utility bill as through the subscription process. Mm -hmm. Yes. But not, necess not necessarily via national grid. They no. sign up through national grid. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. They sign up through the community solar program through their utility. They they can be a subscriber to the project and they can. And is that something that everybody well. like in the area would get something like saying, "Hey, you have this in your area." I, I mean, did. I did already. You probably. I mean, I'm, I'm not even here yeah. so yeah. far. So yeah. Yeah. And, and in other localities, we in other yeah, localities we've helped get that word out. You know, and so they and would get something. Yeah. If they sign up for it, yes. Not it's not. Know. It's not like tons of money, but it's like you know cents per kilowatt hour. So that's like 10 percent. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Maybe 10 percent. that you got in the back of, out of 105 reviews. Can I have a brief clarification? This is the notice I got in the mail about last meeting, and it said that this project involves ground-mounted fixed tilt photovoltaic voltaic cells or panels. Fixed tilt. These guys are talking about the ones that flop around. What is it? Fixed tilt. It's fixed tilt, but you said they go with the sun. That's the tilt. It, it tilts like this on a fixed axis. Fixed tilt. Fixed, fixed tilt to me is stationary. 
That's well, what fix, I think. No, fix is stationary. Tilt right. is it, it tilts. It tilts. It tilts. But oh, okay, it, I just thought fixed tilt was like the angle for the ideal sun to hit it. Is this you know, a working meeting, or are we allowed to speak? Or, no, I just it actually it out. no. Okay. I just Thank you. Oh no, I'm sorry. Of, I'm I'm getting that wrong. Yeah, 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 you can. I'm, I'm talking about trackers. <laughs> I, I apologize. These are. I mean, I would love. I'm, I would love to speak too, but I, I was of the understanding that you're working. What you what you can do is email us with any of your comments that you don't feel that we've received. Okay, Dave. Because we we've been listening to this, we had a public hearing oh, already. Besides so this, so um. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, they they should be trackers. So what was that you were referencing? This is what the neighbors got in the mail. You can look at this. I don't know if I'm out of line here, but it's just it's no, confusing. It, it should be clarified. It should be clarified. Well, I took it. I took it off your application. Fixed. I so, wrote that. Yes. Now okay. I would just take that as fixed angles. You know, you don't want it pointing away from no, the no, you're correct. So it's confusing. Yes, I, I apologize. All right. Okay, so, does the planning board have any understand? more questions? Anyone from the planning board? Okay, uh, do, Steve or Dan, do you have anything to add tonight? No, I'm not, unless you have any other questions. Um, apparently there's no other questions. It might be next time because we got a lot of information tonight. That's just what I was going to say. We, we're a very diverse board. Uh, you'd be surprised the background some of us have. And uh, we're going to take all the information. We're going to study it. We're going to get ready to do the seeker. And um, hopefully we're going to do the best that we can for for everyone. That That's our goal. We, oh, we also, so in the letter that was sent Friday, we indicated the noise analysis that was requested was uh, not ready at that time. We have them here, so we have, we um, can send out the, we can share this noise analysis that we did that was in response to the other previous rounds of comments, or we can just send them electronically if you want. You have it for everyone? Uh, we should, yeah. I printed it all, so you might take it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if you would like to pass that out, that would be fine. Sure. More, more for us to read. Yes. Yeah. Plus, everyone gets the letter that you sent me with uh, with the six different uh, the letters and and the diagrams and everything. So yeah. they'll have that to look at this week. And we just we just double checked, and that fixed tilt issue is uh, that's a complete misnomer on our part, and we will correct that in the application because they will be we are planning on track. Okay, we're going to go on with our with the rest of our planning board meeting. Uh, this ends the discussion tonight. We will be meeting on the 20th. Um, an agenda will go out. I don't know if the seeker will be ready. If it is, that's what we'll be doing that night. But I can't tell you that until we, until our staff is ready to to tell us that it's done. Okay. The next thing on our agenda is uh, Steve Mountain and just. Uh, Quick discussion on Bigelow Creek. Dan, uh, Don asked a question last week, and you were going to talk to him about. I'll uh, talk to him about it. Yeah, we went over it last meeting, but just to give you, I think I said I'd bring a map. This meeting. There's one for each project. Pass the cookies around on that side too. They smell delicious, but I'm, I'm like, I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm bad. 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 i am if anybody would like a zucchini bar, we have some up here. <laughs> I'm sure they're very good. Um, yeah, yeah. Dan's wife. He probably grew the zucchini, right? Yeah, threw the zucchini and took the bar. Okay. Don't tell my wife, but this is way better than the things she's made from zucchini. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. 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 Oh,
Yeah, there's a real one. Okay, Steve, you're up. Can you hear me right? Yeah, I think so. Thanks for coaching. We're going on with our meeting. No. No. Yeah, so last, or was it last meeting or a couple meetings? Last meeting. Last meeting. Um, because we have the Country Meadows expansion application in, and um, in addition to that, we've had an ongoing drainage project on the uh, Bigelow Creek. Um, we started it in 2018. Uh, we did some engineering. Um, we've had a lot of problems on uh, flooding on uh, Bigelow Creek, a lot of erosion happening, and uh, a lot of contamination going to the uh, uh, Bigelow Creek watershed. So we've been working uh, for uh, five years now, uh, coming up with a plan and looking for funding to help uh, solve and alleviate the problems there. So, I mean, most of you are familiar with kind of the, the drainage around Spring of Drive. We've, we've seen that a lot of times. It came up in the public hearings. Uh, and so the drainage, you know, from that area, um, really Spring of Drive, Violet Lane, and, and everywhere west of there, kind of uh, meanders, you know, through the Country Meadows property. Um, onto the Thompson property, and then down to uh, uh, Batavia Stafford Town Line Road, Byron Road. Um, drainage from the college also heads that direction, goes south from the college, it heads into there. So we have a lot of water flow heading into there, and, and you know the only way to solve drainage issues is to hold it back. So we uh, prepared an engineering report, and I can leave that for anybody that wants to, or I can email it if, uh, if you want to read more about it. You want to, I'll give it to Dan. E oh, email? To email? Yeah, email yeah, to yeah, me yeah, and I'll forward it. Send it out. Um, in the uh, 11 by 17, if you want to kind of take a look at those and kind of pass them, you know, towards the front. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to make too many copies. So, you know, the, the blue areas are really the, uh, you know, the proposed pond uh, stormwater systems that we uh, had in our application uh, for grant dollars. We were successful in uh, uh, securing $250,000 of grant dollars. Um, there is a match, which we're going to do with local forces and build things. And uh, we've been work working with landowners to uh, be able to get easements or acquire land to do those. So, you know, one of the questions came up, you know, how does that affect uh, Country Meadows? We've been working with them prior to the new owners. Um, the previous owners weren't, didn't seem like they really wanted to develop that area. Um, there's a stream that goes through there, the Big Little Creek headwaters. Um, and you know, we've been negotiating with them for some additional land to improve. Um, one of which was, you know, the corner. There's several options of where we can do it. Um, so that kind of affects that. And essentially, all it's doing is catching the water, holding it, and releasing it slow. And uh, it, uh, it kind of goes across the rock ledge. And what happens is when it goes over that ledge, it picks up velocity, and that's where all the erosion happens. And our sewer uh, system runs alongside that, so it's another reason we needed to try to tackle that project. Would it include treatment or just the uh, detention? It's water quality. So there's like We're going to get natural water so quality treatment. Yeah. So the community stormwater treatment pond, yeah. it would be like banked up? Because you can't go down very deep there. That rock. Right, on, on Thompson's property, there will be a dam that's built, and so it will take some of, of the land, of the, you know, the farmland, although we'll, we're trying to design it such it could still be farmed other than those large rain events. So um, that's something that until we get a final plan, we have to get to final negotiations with landowners. Um, but yeah, that's it's bedrock right along, um, well, just to the north of Country Meadows property. 
bedrock's very shallow. Yeah. So that was that's the uh, that's the project. Yeah, you have funding for this now, or you still? We have funding. It's a five-year program. Looking at it and see. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh -huh. Now our next thing is our zoning enforcement officer report, and he went out he someplace. <laughs> so, so I guess we'll skip down to mine, and I don't really have one other than our next meeting right now is up in the air until you get back to me with the seeker. If you're ready to, we have we could do the seeker on the solar farm and the seeker on country meadows at our next meeting if you have all the information you need. Yeah, I mean, we'll look at the information that was brought up both, both the uh, um, residents, property owners. There's a lot of stuff in The developer, of. make sure that we gather all the engineering information and uh, um, again, make sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. But I mean, it appears that we'll have all the information for your next meeting. Even with Country Meadows? Uh, Country Meadows, no. They, uh, we. Just got the a draft traffic report and we're reviewing that. Um, the developer still has to provide a lot more um, information on that project. And you'll be able to provide some of that to us, you know, that is applicable to Seeker? For for Country Meadows. Country Meadows. Yeah. Steve's you know, doing Because I'm going to Seeker and I, yeah. I want to make sure like I's are dotted T's across exactly. because of yeah. that project. And I don't see yeah. that foresee that getting that information before next meeting yeah. but if we do I'll, I'll get it over to you yeah. I'll get you all the so well you get the, the same downloads but yeah. we'll summarize it and uh, and go through everything make sure that we have everything so that you can you know then make your decisions hey is Dan in the hallway can he come in Steve yes any you have any exception of the time frame that would be well? Uh, well, we've, we've got to get it done in another two and a half years. Yeah, it's kind of wanted to get Park Road done, and then we're going to jump out and kind of get the final design and negotiations back. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, your zoning officer report? Dan's, yes, I can give you my report. <laughs> Whew, okay, I can be really quick on this. Um, for the next meeting, West Main Mini Mart, I'll call it a, a Mini Mart on West Main, which used to be the old Georgie Porgies, then it went over to Clores. They're looking to change the use of that building on the interior. Um, I will give you a background really quick, briefly. They, they've already begun stuff inside interior modifications um, without receiving a permit. So we went down there and stopped them. They also put up a sign without a valid permit. So we went down there and had them remove the sign. The box shell is still up there. We received complaints at the end of last week about the lighting down there. Mm -hmm. That is the next issue that I'm dealing with them with. There is a uh, <laughs> disconnect in language barrier that is up with the applicants. Um, but I have provided them the date to get on, and they will have representatives here at the next planning board meeting. Um, what are they looking for? They're Come looking, they're, it does not need to go to the county under the new agreement that we have with the county, but they will be looking for site plan review and um, it does not require a special use permit. So it's going to be for specifically site plan review as permitted use for them. Does it need have, a site plan if they're not changing anything? It, it does. Um, it needs a site plan for a few reasons. We need to make sure, number one, that there's adamant parking because it's changing from one use to another and it's sat our code states anything that sets or sets there stagnant for 18 months cessation period needs to be reviewed again before they open prior to opening. Yeah. So because our code requires that, they need to come in front of the planning board. We need to discuss and make sure that they do have traffic, what their actual intent is for what they're selling, um, how they're selling it, what they're doing. We need a full scope. I do have stuff that I will send to you that got scanned in on Friday from them that we have finally received. So I will send that over to you, Kathy, if you would distribute that to the board, what they provided me, but they do need to come in front of here and get a review prior to opening as per what it states in our code. So they're allowed to do what they're asking to do? They're allowed to do retail. <laughs> I will leave it at that. Okay. What they provided us that they are going to sell retail-wise is 
not specifically what I have visually witnessed in there, um, <laughs> the product wise. So that is something that needs to be specified through you, the planning board. And then if it is not an allowed use at that point when they specifically tell you, because they will not specifically tell me, other than what they wrote down on their application, <coughs> then it will be addressed, I believe, by the town board, because the town board did not opt to <coughs> sell the product that they have in the store currently. What did they put on their application? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they say much more. <laughs> they put, the they put <laughs> down food, snacks, milk, groceries, and et cetera. Well, they probably will sell a lot of Cheetos. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I, I <laughs> want to be clear, that is, that's something that will be coming in front of the planning board. Well, um, I'll be very specific about what I have about. Yes. Um, the parking is terrible uh, there, it, and the traffic is terrible there. It is. I just want you to understand, they would be going from a restaurant, because that's what it was last used for, to <coughs> retail. So it is a change of use. It does require to come in front of you, and it has that okay. vacant for over Send years. us the information, and we'll be ready for it. I will send that over to you tomorrow. Okay. Other than that, I do not what, have anything What about that, um, you've got the, the one where John and Mary's was? John and Mary's is, that's going to be another, it's going from restaurant to restaurant, and it did not set vacant for 18 months. Hmm. Oh, so, so it will be a restaurant again. So, yes. Oh, okay. From my understanding, that will be a restaurant. Okay, that's good. Pizza place? If it, if it, if it, changes, more if it changes anything <laughs> after or before that, I will be 100% bringing it to you guys if they change their use. We heard anything more on the, uh, the old Kmart Plaza? Mm, we have submittal for applications for construction stuff for that. Um, but I haven't received anything more other than, and you did see Spirit Halloween. Right now did put in an application to go back in there, so we are following all New York State code. They are allowed to go back in there right now. Um, should they want to go in after the other development is built, then that will be something that does come to the planning board. Because they're going from retail to retail, and we do not have an issued building permit for the vendors and development up front. We go ahead final site plan approval or right. waiting on a resubmittal so, so because of that timing it does not have an impact but if anything should moving forward okay. after the Benderson receives permitting is complete go into that Kmart it will have to come in front of the planning board for a review okay. just to make sure once again that we're covering parking any other aesthetic aspects that you guys would like to see and and we'll go from there when we receive it <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, okay. uh, what about the restaurant that's going to come up front of Kmart? Have they told you what that is yet? They have handed in the drawings on my desk over the weekend. Um, I would have to go look for specifics. If you can tell us next time. If, if there are specific names on there, I don't know because they just submitted for the show itself. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have nothing more to say uh, except to be ready next week will be, the next meeting will be a, another tough one. This was tough. It's hard to hear both sides, but uh, we're going to do the very best we can with what we're, we are supposed to do. So thank you, everyone. Candy, and I want to make an announcement to everybody. Paul and I will not be here for the October 4th meeting. I have asked Don to take the meeting minutes for it. Okay. All right. Yep, we got that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Um, we went to adjourn in second. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. I bet you yes. seconded by Jen. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much.